Oh, that was great. Thank you for sharing all the real secrets. We won't tell everyone else. <laughs> Just kidding, everyone. As people file in, welcome. We're talking with Lisa Forrest today. I'm going to run the introduction reel, uh, and then we're going to get down to it. We've already got some people in the room. Hang tight. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Awesome. Welcome, Lisa. And and for everyone who's filing into the live stream, um, why don't we start off? Uh, I'd like to say that it's been almost a year since you were last here. You came in April of 2022. Um, and if you guys are watching the replay, we'll, we'll put a link to, to last year's interview here, too. So you can go back and check that one out if you wish. But for those who, who missed the last interview or who haven't run into you uh, in all the other interviews and your, you know, your Twitter conversations and everything, why don't you give us a quick introduction about who Lisa Forrest is? Great. Thanks, David. Thanks so much for having me. Your, your audience is always so engaged and we get great questions and great follow-ups. So thanks for having me again. It will be interesting to compare and contrast my comments this time versus last time. Uh, I'm Lisa Forrest. I am a uh, co-director of Live Oak Bank's Sponsor Finance Search Fund Lending Division. I co-direct uh, along with my partner, Heather Anderson. We have uh, been working together for 12 years and we've been at Live Oak for going on six now. And we specialize in this space called Search Fund. We do a lot of self-funded search um, acquisitions, which are really SBA, Small Business Administration Lending. And aside from all the fancy monikers, it is really small business acquisition. So there is also a subset um, that like to call them sort of SMB acquirers. Uh, we just say next generation of business acquirer or business acquisition. And I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, a couple of people who were very eager about you coming back actually sent me in some different questions. So I've got a list of questions here. And then I know we also have uh, some people that have already joined us live and have already started to, to leave some comments. So we're going to go through those as well as we go through our, our conversation. Um, you did mention SBA. And for people that may not understand what that is, it's it's a guarantee program sponsored by the U.S. government that helps small business people get loans, Correct. Correct. And how it works is you're, you're actually borrowing money from a bank, a participating bank that participates in the SBA program. And if you are, if we're talking business acquisition here for purposes of our conversations, for the most part, so you're going to be using the 7A program. And that's hopefully the, I'll try to keep as much jargon out of this conversation as possible, but it's the SBA 7A program. And what happens is that the U.S. Small Business Administration guarantees a portion of your bank's loan that they're giving you, say 75% generally. So that that is supposed to compel your bank, banking banks out there to provide cash flow loans for business acquisition. Uh, the guarantee on your bank's loan is supposed to be, in theory, mitigating lack of outside collateral. So uh, banks can provide cash flow oriented loans for business acquisition. And so what's important about this is that in normally uh, without the SBA guarantee, a bank is going to look at all the different elements of a deal. And of course, you know, they're lending out depositor money. They don't want to lose their money. And so they're always concerned about what, you know, collateral might be there or things like this. And this loan allows them to do deals that they would not normally do. And so this is what allows you to, to fund a relatively high percentage of acquisition financing versus people who are not using this kind of program or people who might be in different places in the world. Yeah, that's the theory. Absolutely. That, that's right. kind of your sources of repayment. You have cash flow uh, is the primary source of repayment on the kinds of transactions we're doing. And if, you, if you're lacking secondary sources of repayment, such as collateral or your personal financial statement, lots of excess personal resources, the SBA guarantee is there to mitigate lack of secondary sources of repayment. 
So the SBA 7A program goes through a cycle of updates and renewals where they change their standard operating procedures. Uh, can you tell us how often that happens and, and when it may be happening next? Yeah, and that's the SBA SOP, as you've uh, stated, the standard operating procedure in the parlance in our industry, it's called the SOP. And so when, if you've ever heard that bandied around SOP, it's, it's sort of the rule book and it's very thick and it is very detailed, lots of rules and regulations. And that's why working with an SBA lender, and there's lots of really good SBA lenders in our industry. We're very lucky to have a lot of specialists. So just make sure you're working with an SBA lender that really understands the SOP. And it could change annually or it can change even more so than that. But generally there's sort of an annual cadence and it'll go through really long periods of time where there aren't any changes to it at all. Um, there's usually a comment period at the end of every fiscal year. Uh, the fiscal year of the government runs through September, um, start September to September. So generally there's sort of comment periods if they are suggesting any changes to that SOP. There's some rumors and, and that's as best as I can say right now on some of the rumors mm. on some of the changes. And generally, I, I think originally supposed to the um, ratifications were supposed to come out at the beginning of this year. Now we're you know, right through the middle of February already. I, I, another rumor we've heard is that if, if there's any changes or the ratifications of the next uh, SOP might not even come out until June. Um, they kind of work under their time scale. But some of the rumors are against 100% uh, or, or some of the rumors are that yes, we might now allow rollover equity where you don't have to buy 100% of the company and the seller can roll some portion of their ownership so that they can stay on for longer than a year, uh, stay on to get benefit of uh, equity um you know, performance increases, things like that. It's a rumor. I have no idea if that's if that's going to happen. Uh, where that might come in handy, uh, I think for our acquirers out there that have been looking at, at um, companies, sometimes our sellers will provide some sort of um, incentive comp and will keep a key employee uh, on um, in a five or a ten percent ownership role from a seller uh, from a sales compensation perspective or a compensation perspective. So it gets a little tricky when that seller tries to sell the company because an employee that needs to transition, uh, an employee owns five or ten percent, but the SBA also piece that you have to buy one hundred percent of the company. So it gets tricky when you have a minority owner that's really just an employee. So that might help solve yeah. that. Um, there's been some other um, rumors about changing sort of affiliations on, you know, how, how many SBA loans you can have and things, but it's all rumors at this point. So we aren't. Is there an, is there an industry feedback component to the deliberation process? Do they go out and ask people in the industry what they would like and things like this? Yeah, there's an open comment period that, uh, you know, bankers, um, people that um, are small business owners, bankers. You know, maybe even brokers, advisors, um, CPAs, accountants, attorneys, uh, folks that are using SBA loans for their clients and also small business owners themselves. There's an open comment period. Anyone can come in and comment. Awesome. And and this really speaks, actually, I just noticed to Jordan's question, who was saying that he's looking forward to see what changes may have happened. But the answer is we don't know yet. We don't know. Uh, because they haven't been delivered. And all just rumors at this point in time. And I've been doing this. This is my I'm kind of into my 30 years plus of SBA. And you 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 never know how to expect or anticipate. Uh, so you, you don't you could you could speculate as much as you want. But we just have to wait and see if there's any changes. So um, all of our right. rules and regulations that are currently in place from an SBA standpoint, that's how we're following our loan transactions now. Well, I certainly know one thing that's changed in a big way with SBA loans, and that is the interest rate. Uh, because the interest rate's been going up like crazy, and and I've gotten a bunch of questions that people had about SBA interest rates. Um, would you remind us, you know, a year ago when you were here in April, what would the rates have been for your clients at the bank versus today? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to kind of look at some of my screens. I have a bunch of notes up. I've actually run a sample example, same time last year to now. And so I just want to pull up okay. my a uh, couple of my data points here. Bear with me. I think we were at, Prime was at three and a quarter last, same time last year. 
actually in January, I think it was at three, then we were at three and a quarter, same time. And now we're at, you know, 775 now. So at the time we were all in at, you know, interest rates of 5% on your lending. Now we're talking nine and a half, nine and three quarters, 10% interest rate. So that's a full four, four points of cost of capital to digest. Yeah. So if I may, same time last year, I kind of ran a sample structure <clears throat> on say a $750,000 EBITDA company, say it was at 3 million, selling for 3 million you know, kind of a four, four times multiple at 3 million, 750,000 of EBITDA. Uh, at that time, we would have probably been at, you know, a 1.6 debt service it's coverage, service giving sort of 10% down 10% seller note on a five-year amortization. And we're doing 80% financing, which is a really kind of down the fairway structure, 80 loan, 10 equity, 10 seller note, five-year amortization, super down the fairway SBA structure. So on that $3 million structure, 750 of EBITDA, we would have been sort of at a break-even debt service coverage in 19, like a 135 in 2020, like a 1.6 in 2021. So if we were looking at this loan beginning of 2022, so the last three years after that would have been a nice, you know, a nice growth. We would have done that transaction on that same transaction. And, and I will note, and, and your listeners that, that have heard me speak before at Live Oak, we want a 1.5 debt service coverage. That is our point of view. That's my point of view of doing this for you know thirty plus years on on having enough margin to transition. And, and so, debt service coverage of one point five means that you've got a dollar fifty of EBITDA for every dollar you've committed to give to the bank. Correct. Correct on total debt, and that's my my bank debt plus the seller note as well and interest okay. only. So it's the cash. So for every part. dollar every dollar that's going to pay debt, you have a dollar fifty of EBITDA, right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. I just wanted to be clear for people who may not understand the concept. Yeah, exactly. So on that same, and again, every bank can have their own point of view. There, I think most banks will probably allow a 1.25. That you're going to hear that out there when you're you're talking to other lenders. A 1.25 debt service coverage is is also very common in the SBA industry. We've heard of even, you know, some lenders going down to 1.1 because production has decreased and they're trying to keep their production levels up, so they're decreasing uh, debt service coverage hurdles. It's not our point of view, but there's lots of points of view. It's um, and I'll come back to this debt service coverage, but it's really important for you to have your point of view and what you think first and then really make sure you've got a good fit with your lender in their point of view as well. So my comments here on comparing and contrasting a, a transaction today versus the same time last year, it's with the point of view of at least wanting a minimum of a 1.5 debt service coverage in the last full year. So same time last year, a three million dollar transaction enterprise value digesting 80% debt, a SBA debt, plus a 10% seller note on a five-year amortization and bringing in 10% equity, you would have hit minimally hit sort of our hurdles. So that okay. same transaction now at 3 million, you would have been on that same cadence, you would have been well below debt service coverage in 2019. You would have been around a 1.1-ish in 2020 and in 2021 you've been would have been below a 1.5 on 3 million so that's a transaction we probably wouldn't have done today in fact i know we wouldn't have however there mm. are some lenders it's still above a 125 debt service coverage so there are some lenders that still might be doing that transaction uh but we still have more interest rate hikes to digest as well and you know it just really depends on what industry that company is in uh, was that three million of, of enterprise, and was that seven fifty of EBITDA sustainable? There's so much nuance that we'll get to around what goes into EBITDA and sustainability. So that same deal at our debt service coverage hurdles, really, uh, it's probably more like a two and a half million dollar enterprise. I mean, that's kind of really a half a turn of value to at least be at a one point five debt service coverage today, where. Wow. At two and a half million of, 
of enterprise value on 750,000 of EBITDA, they would have been at a 1.88 debt service coverage same time last year. Today, they're just probably at about a 1.6-ish. And then when you bake in even more interest rate um, uh, hikes, uh, then they're probably on a tested basis, they'd be at 1.5. So, so do you, know, you do you stress test these deals and say, will this still work if the rates go up another point and a half or something? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we've and always so done that. For 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 everyone who's tuning in, you know, this EBITDA cash flow level, and I, I actually spoke at a conference a couple of weeks ago where I talked about these cash flow levels. That's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, which means that 750 of EBITDA that we're basing all this discussion about. Once you have the 750, you still have to pay your interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And depreciation and amortization that just represents capital expenditure. So out of that 750, um, you know what you're saying is number one that I the interest cost is going way up. So now we have more of that 750 being eaten up by interest. So in this case, with a you know let's say a lender that's only requiring a 1.25 debt service coverage ratio. If you have a bump in sales like to the downside and your EBITDA drops by, you know, a little bit, even 10%, you could suddenly not be able to replace your equipment or have trouble paying your taxes or have to choose between paying your taxes or making your loan payment. Absolutely. And with SBA loans, we monitor portfolio by exception. So you could still be paying us back, maybe from savings or maybe elsewhere or minimally paying us back from, from the cash flow of the company, but not growing your company. And most of our clients are, are buying the companies to, to actually grow them. So the reason we've always um, had a 1.5 debt service coverage isn't even from a cyclical standpoint, it's also just to give yourself enough room to transition well, and then have enough ability to grow your company organically, and then maybe even grow by acquisition. So that 1.5 debt service coverage for us, We've always had that, or, or over my career, I've always at least had that minimally because of transition. Transition risk is real in any economy. It's it's real. So you mm. need to have enough margin to do that. And especially when you have an economy that we have right now. And I know there's lots of speculation and an opinion of whether we're in a recession and if there is softening. So to your point, David, you, you want enough margin to be able to handle uncertainty. So we'll we'll have some more we'll talk some more about this, but I, I want to take a little detour around the interest rate conversation some more because there are some questions popping up. You know, Jordan's asking if there's any speculation on rates. Uh, seems to me like you sound like people should be prepared for them to go higher, and I would agree too. I think it's very possible. I think, and I'm not an economist, and this is just you know sort of my layman's opinion. I'm not an expert on this. It's my um, disc disclaimer here. This is just me being, um, you know, a person that's sort of in and around, you know, business acquisition, and I'm not an expert in it. So I think we've digested a lot. And I think that there is still more interest rate increases to come. I don't know by how much, and, and I don't know if they're going to be as steep, but we might still be in for another kind of quarter point, quarter point, quarter point. Um, and so that's why we stress test. And Jordan, to your point, because we're doing cash flow lending and we are not relying on being fully secured, we're we're doing variable rate lending. And that's usually locked for three months at a time as set by sort of the SBA standards. However, there are some lenders that can do fully fixed rates. If we did do a fixed rate, it would probably be for maybe three years at the most. And now we're not talking kind of prime plus 175 or prime plus two. We're probably talking prime plus two and three quarters, prime plus three. So that fixing, because we're obviously in an inconsistent market and an uncertain market, your fixed rate is is absolutely going to be more expensive. But there are some lenders and, that can do that. And this ha has something to do with the source of funds for the particular lender. So um, if if a lender is able to, you know, if, if a bank is selling CDs and locking people in at a certain rate, then they can in turn lock in their loans at the same rate and and secure their spread. So, so it has to do with the type of organization you are. And, and, and Live Oak isn't a deposit-taking or a bank, is it? We 
we are in fact a deposit taking organization. Oh, okay. We have really Sorry. good savings rates and we're we're actually moving to more of a deposit bank now. We've been that's been an initiative for us for so we can actually bank our customers. However, our okay. cost of funds compared to Bank of America is going to be very very different. So you brought up the cost of funds comment and that's where you want to talk with your lender to find out what their cost of fund situation is and it's almost and it's also risk rating too. It's also pricing for risk. We are helping you buy cash flow. We aren't helping you buy a long-term fixed asset that we can liquidate if something bad happens too. So it's also risk-based pricing in addition and in combination with your cost of funds. And, and so for somebody who already has an SBA loan with, with Live Oak, um, what does it look like if I'm an operator uh, when um, I mean, I'm hearing that interest rates are going up? Just mechanically, how does it happen to my loan? Uh, like what 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 happens for my rate to increase? Yeah, and so from I would say for the most part, most SBA seven A loans, these are these business acquisition loans. Most lenders are are providing that debt to you on a variable rate basis, and that's locked for three months at a time. It's a quarterly lock. Okay. So if um, January, February, March, April, May, June, you know, so you know we've got our our quarters. If your rate changes, if, if prime changes in February, you are still locked in for January, February, March, whatever your prime rate base was, you're locked in for a whole quarter. Come the next quarter, starting April, then your interest rate will go up for that next quarter if prime has, in fact, gone up within a quarter. So they're quarterly jumps. And um, I know I should know the answer to this, but uh, I, I assume you get some uh, notice in the mail, but I'm going to say, and I and I have a lot of interaction with my servicing colleagues, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. We have a lot of collaboration here at Live Oak in particular. Um, I assume we send you a notice, but I don't know. <laughs> well, it's, um, you know, I, I would, I would, uh, so what you're describing is that if if the Fed increases rates a few times in the quarter, Ultimately, the jump someone experiences yeah. could be quite sizable. Absolutely. Because they're no going to feel it all at once. Yeah. No question. Um, so with the increase in rates, you know, I know that you do a weekly office hours where you talk with prospective business buyers and answer a lot of general questions for people. Um, what has it done for the volume of your conversations and the volume of, of searchers that are talking with you? Has there been any change since the interest rates have gone up so much? We have not seen any decrease in the interest level. In fact, we've seen an increase in the interest level for this business acquisition. Whether you call yourself a self-funded searcher or you call yourself an SMB acquirer, whatever moniker you 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 know how you self-describe yourself, <clears throat> we've seen an explosion in the interest level for business acquisition. And it you know, our business schools are, are teaching this as a concept, entrepreneurship through acquisition, ETA. You'll also see that um, out there on the, the social waves as well. So ETA is being literally taught in our business schools. And we also see business acquisition can be a very counter cyclical idea as well. It does really well when the economy does well, but it's also a counter cyclical idea too. If you're a little uncertain about your job, your W-2 job, then the idea of owning your own destiny and, and owning your own company, that also increases interest levels when there might be uh, uncertainty in the economy. So our office hours are heavily attended week in and week out. Okay. And is that converting into the same volume of loans that you were doing a year ago? I would say last year and the years before, so we're starting our third year now of these weekly office hours. Every Wednesday, we do a deep dive into how SBA loans work and, and, and kind of go through a slide deck on what an average loan looks like. And then on Thursday, we actually share our cash flow model, our executive summary template. And we have a new qualitative matrix that Heather Anderson and I came up with. It's our HLQ matrix, where we tried to put a do-it-yourself format together so that you can think about the qualitative aspects of the acquisition that you're you're thinking about. It's not just debt service coverage. It's about all these other qualitative aspects, which I, I think we're going to have time to get to. We do that every Thursday. So same time last year, <clears throat> I think we were seeing the opportunities in the market that were sort of more doable or more financeable. <clears throat> 
now a year later, we're still having the same amount of conversations, if not more. And I think the our acquirers are really struggling to find opportunities that are financeable. Or, or they're having to make decisions. We're all having to make decisions on, is it financeable, but at maybe a lesser debt service coverage? So they might be financeable, but maybe at a tighter margin. And for us, we have not so, changed our minimum coverage levels. So we're seeing fewer deals that are interesting to us. So what you're describing basically is that the buyers and sellers are trying to live in the market as though the cost of money hasn't changed. They're, they're trying to do the deals at the same prices and they're ignoring the fact that it costs more to get the money. I think that that is a accurate observation. And, and the thing, they're not ignoring it because it's very, it's very obvious. Very obvious. So, so folks are having to decide, okay. does this make sense to me at a lower debt service coverage? Because right now we have not seen, we have not seen the sellers coming down on prices and we haven't necessarily seen acquirers wanting to bring in more equity either so if prices don't come down and you're still trying to get 80 percent financing then the thing that moves is debt service coverage so uh you know we're right in the middle of this david i i i'm i'm in the middle of this with you so i'm yeah. literally getting observations on a daily basis to try to come up with what my opinion is what what um and and so obviously you talk with these borrowers when they're uh, applying for loans and they're they're working through this progress and they're doing the acquisitions and you know these people after that happens what kind of things are you starting to see from people post transaction we we know that sometimes there's hiccups and bumps when people take over a business uh, but what what anecdotally can you share about some of the things that you're seeing so that's a great segue <clears throat> uh, and this is all anecdotal we're right in the middle of this. I don't, you know, it's not my, my bank hasn't come up with, oh, these are the trends and these are the things we know. I mean, we were right in the middle of this. So just observationally, and I'm going to say this is an unqualified observation at this point in time, just to uh, share some thoughts. So we are seeing some of our acquirers struggle, uh, not that they're not going to pay their loans, not that they're... Um, you know, calling it quits or anything like that, but they're seeing some struggles and it depends on what industry you're in. We are seeing some struggles for deals where the seller was way more involved in the sales generation process than was indicated. Mm -hmm. And we're coming off of a, you know, a 10 year plus economic expansion, expansion, even with COVID, even with COVID interrupting that. So, so there um, are some companies where the sales generation, the revenue generation process was a little bit on autopilot. And now the sales generation effort is real because, you know, even if it's just a 10 percent decrease in customers coming to that company for whatever the product or services, even if it's just a 10 percent dip, which was sort of automatic before. Now our new um, owners are really having to get in, make sure they understand how the revenue is generated. And it has to be an active, an active offensive. You are, are on offense now trying to make up for a little bit of dip. And our, our clients are buying these companies to actually grow them. So now what's happening is they're having to really understand the company, first of all, and now generate sales just to keep you at par. And, and they were coming into these companies thinking they were just going to grow them from the get go. So, you, you know, you you remind me of back when I first got out of university. What you just said reminds me of my days at the Yellow Pages, uh, because we used to have these management people come in from the big office towers, you know, in Toronto or Montreal. And they would come and say, you guys do a great job, you know. You, you just come to work every day and every day the business grows every year, the business grows by three or 4%. It's an easy business. And we would say every year, 10% of our revenue is canceled. We have to go and find the 10% and then get another three or four to meet your goals. 
And so, and, and, and this is the reality of a lot of businesses. You have this turnover, this turnover. And if you've, if you've spent your time analyzing a business just by looking at the spreadsheets of their sales results, I think sometimes you don't appreciate just what goes into making those numbers happen. Yeah. And sometimes the, in a certain expansion cycle, the company can do well in spite of itself. The company can do well without yes. really doing anything. And so I'm not saying sellers are being dishonest. I think they, you know, they've been, these companies have had benefit of, of really long uh, expansion cycle. And I think what's catching some of our new uh, CEOs by surprise is the level of effort that is taking on the sales side. And especially when the seller was the one that was really doing the selling or really owned the sales relationship management process. So now our new acquirers are coming in, they have to learn the company. And now they're, they're in the seat of really having to be that sales relationship person. And a nuance on that, I was just gonna say, and a nuance on that is, uh, how well are you getting along with the seller post-close? I mean, it's kind of a toss up. If you're getting along with the seller, great. That might be in 50% of our cases. That's fantastic. They're going to be your river guide. What happens when you buy a company and you don't get along with the seller immediately? Now you have to learn the company and now you're the salesperson. So yeah. a big heavy lift. The, I mean, I'm on record many, many, many times for saying you want a material seller financing because nothing will keep the seller aligned with you like knowing his note payments depend on your success. And if it's, so if, it, if there's a material amount of, of seller financing, then that person knows they, that you need to succeed. And they're more, in my opinion, going to be more willing to be that coach, advisor, mentor, answer your phone calls, you know, want to be helpful, et cetera. Um, so I, I think these are great comments. You mentioned a little while ago how you started that qualitative conversation with prospective buyers. Is a lot of that driven by some of these things that you've been experiencing to get people to to look just away from the numbers at some of the other very important things as well? Absolutely, one hundred percent. And these are things that that um, Heather and I have preached for you know thirty plus years on doing business acquisition. We also have an M and A questionnaire where all these things come into play, and it's on every transaction always. Not. And especially then when you you may, might have some softening out there, it becomes even more apparent that these are important things. But the qualitative aspect has been something that that I have always tried to bring to um, the analysis. And again, we're not for everybody. I mean, I, I'm going to dive in and ask a lot of really tough questions because I, I want you to do well. I want you to transition and I want you to be really successful. There's nothing worse than having someone buy a company and it not work out well. And the qualitative part is so important. What's the seller's role really? Who's doing the estimating? Who's doing the selling? Who owns the relationship? Uh, seller dependencies is one of the key things. What's the culture of the company? And these are hard things to get mm. at also. So I'm not suggesting any of this is easy. Um, the culture of the company. Customer concentrations are huge. Even if you've got a 15% customer concentration. So we've got a client right now had a 15% customer concentration transition lost that customer and had a 10% decrease in sales volumes. That acquirer yeah. is struggling and, right now. And, and businesses are asymmetrical systems. So a relative, you're talking, you just described a 25% drop in sales that that could result in a 50% drop in the cash flow, depending on what the ratio of direct to fixed overhead right. costs are. And this is, in a situation where the buyer and seller aren't necessarily um, copacetic. And this is one where then you have to have a really good relationship with your bank. Uh, this, this customer brought it to our attention immediately. And so we're introducing that person to lots of industry experts and we're trying to bring him and, you know, he's, he's digging in, he's digging in. I mean, and so this is not one yep. that, you know, we're concerned about long-term, but this uh, a new CEO is in a situation that that he was not expecting it to look like this. And same time last year, we probably would have had a, um, a better runway maybe. Yeah. Well, we have an interesting question here from Kevin uh, who asked what the climate is like for refinancing to pay out seller financing. Now, this obviously doesn't usually happen in the immediate term after a deal is closed. Can you describe, Lisa, when, at what point or what it looks like when the bank might be interested in paying out the balance of a, of a seller note? 
Sure. And I can imagine that the, the question might be asked, asked from a couple different perspectives. You know, we were trying to structure a transaction and maybe in order to get, get it done, you've got to put more seller note on there and you think you're just going to refinance that seller out and the seller gets benefit of that, that gap financing that they're literally bringing in. Well, with an SBA loan, you have to be paying on your seller note for two full years. It has to be two full years of seasoning, some amount of payment, at least interest only, if not P&I for two principal and interest for two full years before that seller note's even eligible to be paid. And I will be, and I will say from a lender perspective, uh, we're, we're, and especially if it's just happening, we're probably not too thrilled to let the seller off the hook and for us to take more of the, the um, risk on. But if it's five years down the road, the company's doing well, maybe you had it amortized over 10 due in five, and you've been paying on it for at least two years, if not through five, hey, we might be interested in it. We want to know the debt service. We want to know how it's happening. But if this is an, an immediate need to refinance the seller, that's probably going to be a hard ask. And the seller's going to make, the SBA is going to make you wait two full years paying on that. So that one is yeah. very situational. I'd want to know all the details around that. But we generally don't want to. I've always, yeah. Go ahead, David. I've always said to people that that you know the bank is only going to seriously consider it when you've paid down the principal on the bank loan significantly as well as the seller note, so that if they were to take over that debt, it probably wouldn't put them back even to the same position they started at, you know. Uh, and if the business is still doing well after a few years, that probably means it's a pretty good idea that they may want to do that because obviously the bank is going to see that as as a fairly secure bet to make, you know, with that track record in place and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Transition story and having the company fully transition is going to be really key. But I know in structuring right now, I, I can imagine where the seller says, okay, I'll, I'll do a seller note, but I want the bank to refinance me in two years. or I want the bank to refinance me in three years. And you're might, you might have to be structuring something with a seller note and want, want, wanting to be able to say to the seller, well, let's amortize this over 10 years, but it'll be due in three um, to, to get the deal done. Well, I, you know, it's hard for us to, to, and we're not going to agree to refinance it for sure ahead of time. That's just not how it works. Yeah. I Listen, for everyone in the audience, um, there is nothing that guarantees your ability to access credit in the future. And so when when you have a seller who's saying things like that, like, I'll agree to a 10-year amortization, but I want you to pay me off in three. One of the pieces of advice I've given to a lot of buyers is, is that you can probably negotiate that at the end of three years, maybe the interest rate on that note goes up so that it clearly creates an incentive for the buyer to want to refinance it. But it also has a built-in plan B if you can't. If you can't, you just keep that note at the higher interest rate. And the 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 seller, you know, they're often satisfied that yeah, there's been this um, thing put into my note that really does incentivize this person to try to deliver on their promise to pay it out in three years. But like I said, you can't guarantee that you're going to qualify for credit in the future. We have no idea what's going to happen and as far as the economy or, you know, you know, you mentioned the seven A S O P's. Well, over the course of your career, you've seen the maximum loan to value very wildly, haven't you? Like sure. it's, you know, they, it could go down again. Who knows? And and I want to make um, a comment on this seller note structuring. For us at Live Oak, the annual payments on that seller note are part of our debt service coverage. So our 1.5 includes principal and interest on that seller note. And if it is structured on an amortized 10 due in five, we're we're going to include a five-year amortization in our debt service coverage, by the way. So these are these are in the weeds nuances. And there are some lenders that won't even that, that don't require their debt service coverage to include the seller note. And if it's amortized over 10, they'll include principal and interest payments over 10 years, but it's but it's due in five. So to your to your point uh, on the caller here, and then David, your point, if it is due in five. We want to make sure that you're able to pay it off in that kind of period of time where you're able to digest that versus the uncertainty of having to refinance that note or, you know, make do on that, make good on that in some other way. So we want to make sure that you can afford to pay the enterprise value today based on how the structure is um, put together. And if that, if that seller note's due in five, then we want 
the debt service to be able to afford it at that level. So even though the payment they're making to that seller may be based on a 10-year AM, your math is going to change that to a five-year AM. Right. Yeah. So it's a, that's, a, that's a great bit of insight for people to think about because it would mean that um, if instead you, you did what I suggested and just said after three years or something, the interest rate were to go up, then you wouldn't be accelerating that amortization. Right. Yeah. So, uh, right. and it's a, it's a, it's a nuance. It's in the weeds, but make sure you understand one, make sure you have your own point of view first, make sure you understand what risk level makes sense to you. And then make sure you understand how your bank is calculating what goes into that debt service coverage. Don't just rely on your bank to tell you they like it or don't like it. You need to have your own point of view. And so what, what you've just explained, I mean, that is a live oak thing, right? And what, one of the things that I frequently run into when I'm talking with people and talking about SBA loans is they'll they'll go on the Small Business Administration website and they'll read the details of the loan program over there. And they'll say, this is how it works. And I'll say, well, wait a minute. Those are the SBA's rules, but then the bank rules kind of lay on top of those. Right. And so you can go to one SBA lender and be told one thing and be, go to a different SBA lender and be told a different policy. And it really just comes down to the different sort of guidelines that each bank has based on their own risk measures, tolerances, and, and reasoning. Absolutely. So when you're talking to your lenders you know, ask, is that, is that your bank policy? Is that your approach or is that the SBA's approach? Now there are certain things, the SBA has rules and regulations around certain things that every bank has to follow that, but there are certainly nuances where uh, a lender or a bank can have their own point of view. So definitely just ask. Yeah. And the bank should tell you like here, I've been really, I'm unapologetic about how we calculate our cash flow and what we wanted to pay for in our 1.5. I I don't apologize about that. So definitely ask the bank and they shouldn't be offended by you asking, Hey, is that, is that your policy or is that, you know, SBAs? Yeah. And, and, you know, for everyone listening, you know, when, when, when Lisa talks about, you know, the requirements for the debt service coverage ratio that, uh, that live Oak is asking for, Keep in mind, the, the reason why the bank has these kinds of rules is because what the bank wants is all their money back with interest. I mean, you want to collect the payments. You want your customers to be set up in a manner that will allow them to succeed so that you just get all the payments back. I mean, you're not trying to um, you know, create the biggest book of business that you can regardless of the risk. You're not trying to put people in jeopardy because, of course, what ends up happening why don't you explain to everyone what ends up happening when you can't make that payment? And, and I'm, I've been doing this a, a really long time. And, and the reason why I'm in this lower middle market space is I love my business owners. I want to get paid back with our interest because that's, that's how we make our money. I, I want to put you in a good situation where you can make your money too. I mean, I'm, I get to know my clients and, and I, I care about my borrowers. Um, when things don't go well, I mean, it upsets lives. And that's what we're trying to avoid with all costs. I know the SBA is guaranteeing our loan, but we still lose money in this thing. It's not guaranteed. So, um, and, yeah. you know, you, you for, for clients that, that can't pay us back, I mean, this this ruins, ruins lives, you know. And so uh, any number of things can happen. You know, we're going to try to Try to one get in and understand. You know, maybe we might give you some runway to, you know, maybe defer payments for a while. I suppose, but you know, again, and keep in mind this is not a one size fits all. I'm just throwing um, observations out. We it depends on what the problem is. Did you lose all your customers? Did this was there seller fraud? Did, are you in an industry that just went kaput? Uh, it depends. Are you not a good operator? You know, so not everyone can operate a small business. This is a really hard thing to do. So sometimes you get yourself in a situation where you're in over your head. You bought a good business and you don't know how to operate it. So it all depends on what the situation is. And, uh, you know, we we liquidate homes. We're going to take a lien on your house. And, and sometimes it comes to that where we liquidate the business. You file bankruptcy and we we take equity in your home. We liquidate it. I mean, that's the worst case scenario. We, we don't want you to file bankruptcy. We're, we're trying to, to work with you. Every situation is different. And I mean, I'm, I'm just going to have to kind of leave my, my comments at that. 
Well, and, and but so just so people understand, I mean, if you start to miss payments, what will end up happening is you you become a client of a special division within the bank where they're going to be probably trying to communicate with you more often. And that guarantee that the bank has from the SBA, I mean, the SBA just doesn't write those guarantee checks willy nilly. They are going to require that you go through a whole process to try to recover as much as you can before they want to give up, you know, whatever remainder may be left that that they're liable to pay under the guarantee that they, they gave to you. Yeah, we have, um, every bank has a special assets group or uh, they might even call it SAD, special assets division. Uh, and hopefully you are talking with your lenders for all you business owners out there and, and soon to be business owners or would be business owners. If you see any kind of struggle on the horizon, you want to overreact and not underact. You want to talk to your lender as soon as possible. And there are different, if, if you get into a situation where it looks like you might not be able to make your payments, even if you are currently making your payments, but something is happening where you're uh, eventually not going to be able to make your payments or you're going to be late or you need special dispensation, then you're generally moving from just general servicing to a special assets group that um, are, are more prepared uh, to kind of work with you on, you know, whatever it is that can be done to, to help you get through the situation, hopefully. And so, and that foresight comes from understanding the business and having some kind of cash flow forecast, some kind of understanding of what you expect to come and go as far as money. And the 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 biggest key point of advice I just want to reiterate is communication. As soon as you realize there may be a problem, you want to be communicating with the lender to let them know what your situation is. Absolutely. Um, and and I've personally known many people who've gotten into rough times, and the ones who are open and communicative often remember business is all done between people and so if you are open and communicative with the people at the bank even if they are in the, the special assets group they're going to be more willing to be working with you than if you're dodging phone calls and uh you know not answering the phone or avoiding them etc uh, you're going to make them less happy in dealing with you and in turn they're going to be less likely to want to go out of their way to do anything that might be helpful to you well, and it's a matter of time too. If you catch things early, so, sometimes that gives you enough time to rectify. If you if you wait too long, sometimes there's just no option. So you know you've got to talk to your lenders and be really communicative with them early on. We've got uh, another question here from Jordan. Uh, it's a it's a question about ad backs. So from a lender's perspective, what are acceptable or allowable ad backs for valuation purposes? How does SBA look at base EBITDA number to apply multiple? Uh, and is there a preference on last year or the average of the last three years? What, what are the rules for how you weight maybe the last couple of years of performance if there's any kind of uh, change between them? Sure. So at least uh, my point of view, I want to know what the company did in each and every year. I want to know distinctly what did, how did the company perform in 19, 20, 21, 22 interim. I might even ask you, how did the company perform during COVID? How did the company perform in 2008 maybe? So I want to know exactly what the, I'm not taking an average. You, you might, from a valuation perspective, you might take averages to kind of come up with your price multiple. I'm not the multiples person. I'm the debt service coverage person. And I want to know in each and every year, how's the company doing and why? So I want the story. Having said that, the math on cash flow, and I don't even want to use the word EBITDA because it's kind of confusing. Uh, it can mean lots of different things. And you have seller's discretionary earnings, SDE. So I, I'm just going to say adjusted cash flow for our purposes here. It's net income on the tax return, plus the ad backs that um, you're going to accept and or that your lender are going to accept. So some general ru rules of thumb would be the seller's compensation, as long as it's on a W-2, something that is actually run through the P&L or the tax return, that's an ad back. Mm -hmm. If they have distributions, that's not an ad back because that's a balance sheet item. Sometimes the sell side will or say, well, about, you know, distributions. Like it doesn't yeah. run through the tax return. So W-2, that's an ad back. You might have your seller's Lexus and you're buying a roofing company. So it's, you know, um, things that we typically don't add back. This is a lender to lender thing. We're not going to add back credit cards. And we're not going to add back travel and entertainment. It is too hard to, one, verify. And it is too hard to understand if that Ruth's Chris was for you or was that for your company party. So we we don't 
go down to that level. And if you've got a deal that is made or broken by adding back T and E, then I suggest you might have something that is um, a little too skinny. But there are a lot of sellers that, that might put everything, their cabin, their everything on their American Express, and it's a two hundred thousand dollar American Express bill they want to add back. We typically don't do that. Other lenders might do that. So those are just sort of rules of thumb. Um, and, and I would say quality of earnings reports. These are where you hire uh, accountants to, to actually help you do a forensic review. I highly recommend them. It might cost you 10 or 20,000 bucks to do that, but it is a more thorough uh, audit of the financials. <clears throat> and especially if the tax returns of the company are done on a cash basis and they have a cruel accounting on their P&L and mm. the sell side is suggesting an, a purchase price based on that accrual accounting, we're going to absolutely require a quality of earnings. We're not going to right. take the seller's internal bookkeeper reconciliation from cash to accrual, and we're not going to um, accept the seller's CPA. We would require uh, you to engage a independent third party to reconcile cash to accrual. Yeah. 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 I mean, cash flow based accounting is easy, but it creates so many problems for people. And and in in my opinion, it means that the books can't don't really let you manage the company very well. So I I, I really, especially if you're talking about a business of size that you just mentioned with an EBITDA and the hundreds of thousands of dollars, it surprises me to this day that people are still doing that. But um, um, when you mentioned, I want to know what happened in each year, is that because from a cash flow point of view? If 2019 was kind of lower, you you are thinking, you know, what if the company performs in 24 the way it did in 18? Are you you want to look at those lower performing years just to see how your your cash flow or debt service coverage might add up? Yeah, I mean, it's a story. It tells a story, and and basically what we're doing is understanding the story of that company and and how and why it's done as well as it has, or how and why it's struggled. We are looking for at minimum in the last full year, we're looking for certain, you know, minimums. Are they sustainable? Are they repeatable? If there was a bad year, why, how is, you know, are there risks to downside? What are the downside risks? We are seeing um, a lot of transaction opportunities right now where 2022 has done amazing. I mean, it's outsized performed well. And Maybe in 2021, maybe it barely break even. 2020, 2021, barely break even. 2022 is huge. So uh, is 2022 sustainable? Was that yeah. just a hangover from COVID? Was that a hangover from supply chain concerns in 2021? And they just finally increased their prices in 2022. They didn't actually add any unit sales. They didn't increase their unit sales. They just increased their prices. So knowing what happened in the past helps you understand if current conditions are sustainable. Yeah. And, and, and there's all kinds of other things too, that happen beneath the surface of those numbers. I was having a conversation with someone, uh, I think it might've been on search funder or, or one of the other communities online where someone was talking about this really great performing lumber yard business. And one of, one of my comments was, you know, check out the price of lumber because it's a commodity and so you can see huge growth in the sales of a business like that when they didn't actually sell any more lumber. It's just that the lumber price went up, right? And 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 so these things can have a real impact on on what the business is doing. And and I would imagine that maybe you know someone analyzing a business like that should maybe try to convert into some kind of commodity based accounting, like how how many units of this these goods did we sell each year, or how many tickets or volume of widgets or whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, lumber, price of lumber, lo price of metal, uh, lots, lots of that. We saw, um, I think we're seeing a, a lot of that now where uh, the seller's sell side's trying to say, oh, this number is sustainable. Oh, no, in 2023, it's going to be X, Y, and Z. And, um, and again, I know this sounds all negative. Uh, we're just really trying to decipher best we can so that we're, we're helping lend you money that's putting you in the best situation possible. And we have some companies that are doing very, very well. So, I mean, it's it's not like we don't have some good performers, but we are seeing more of our new CEOs um, having conversations with our servicing department um, than we have in the past. 
Well, I'm, I'm happy that you're sharing that with us. I'm happy that you're letting us know. I know that um, I certainly remember several downturns. I mean, I was a university student in the early 90s recession. Um, and then uh, I was in the business world in the you know financial crisis, 08, 09, into 2010. And so I remember what some of those dips look like. I, I remember driving along commercial streets, seeing every second store, like, you know, with a for rent sign in the windows. And a lot of the times when I'm talking with people who are younger, I, I, I you know, I'll realize, hey, wait a minute, this person never really lived through a recession as an adult. They don't really have the same kind of memories, for example, that maybe people that are more middle-aged might have. And so yeah, I, I'm glad that you're sharing some of these stories with us just so that people you know, get a reality check that you know, business is risky. And the whole reason that you want to buy a business instead of starting one is that hopefully you're avoiding some of the risk by acquiring a business that already has clients and systems and employees and everything in place. But if you don't do your deal correctly, or if you over leverage yourself, or if you pay too much, you can put yourself in the same kind of risk position that somebody trying to start something new might face. Yeah. And that, all those comments really resonate with me. Um, this is maybe my fourth or fifth cycle and I'm, I'm still here lending and, 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 you know, doing, you know, really nice deals, but um, cycles are real and you have to stay disciplined. At least that's my opinion on how I conduct myself and you, you've got to stay disciplined, uh, kind of panic slowly, but do good due diligence and stay disciplined to the basics that, you know, serve clients well over long periods of time. That's great. Lisa, uh, I can't believe we've been talking for about an hour now. Um, as usual, a great conversation. And uh, if people want to learn more about Live Oak or communicate with yourself, what's the easiest way for people to reach out and talk with you? If I haven't scared off every single person on this uh, podcast and you'd still like to talk to me, uh, my email, lisa.forest at liveoak.bank. Um, we've got our office hours. We have a lot of content. So if you email me, I can send you some links and um, I'm on LinkedIn. So feel free to catch me there as well. And what I'll do, Lisa, is I'll put your email and your LinkedIn uh, URL into the show notes uh, for anyone who's watching the recording or if you're watching live, just come back in a few minutes after the show and you'll be able to find that written in there. Uh, and I want to thank you once again. Great interview and uh, best of luck here in 2023. You too. Thank you so much for having me, David. Appreciate it. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Special thanks go to today's video sponsor, Mark Willis of Lake Growth Financial. Mark helps people better manage their personal wealth and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've gotten lots of positive feedback from people I've worked with over the years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find a playlist of all the interviews I've done with Mark and to learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up to arrange a conversation about what this solution might look like for you. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Head over to my blog site at davidcbarnett.com. You'll find hundreds of articles and videos, all for free. You'll find links to my books and online courses, and you can sign up for my email list and get emails covering topics that interest you and be notified of new videos. This episode of Small Business and Deal Making is brought to you by smbpodcastnetwork.com. The network is a collection of podcasts and shows from around the internet, which focus on bringing you interviews with amazing guests who share actionable advice ideas and information for small and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs. Visit www.smbpodcastnetwork.com to find more great shows and easily subscribe to be notified of new episodes. It's a great way to discover quality content. And if you've discovered us today via the network, then I hope you're enjoying the show and will consider subscribing directly so you never miss any one of our great episodes.